What is up guys? This is the second video in our series on ROS2 navigation. In the first part of the series, we generally talked about navigation in mobile robotics and what are the different components, namely localization and mapping for navigation in mobile robotics. To understand this video and even this series, you need the following prerequisites. A basic understanding of ROS1, ROS2, behavior trees and managed or lifecycle nodes in ROS2. I have videos on all of these in my channel. So if you're not clear on any of these, please look at my videos and that'll be super clear for you then. Now, in the previous video, I said that I won't talk much about navigation in ROS1 and mainly jump to navigation in ROS2. But let's actually talk about navigation in ROS1 because that will give us a good platform to talk about the differences between navigation in ROS1 versus ROS2 and then also help us understand navigation in ROS2 much better. Okay, so in this video, we'll start with talking about what navigation in ROS1 is. Then we'll go to the design of navigation in ROS1. What were the major shortcomings of navigation in ROS1, which led to the creation of navigation 2 in ROS2. And then we of course go to navigation in ROS2. And then we talk about its design so that we understand how it's much better than navigation in ROS1. We'll of course talk about both the designs that is navigation 1 in ROS1 which will now be called the nav stack and navigation 2 in ROS2 which will now be called navigation framework in ROS2 or let's call it nav2. So to begin with, what exactly is the nav stack in ROS1? Nav stack is a collection of packages running together in Harmony for the case of navigation in mobile robotics. So you have a robot, a mobile robot, and the nav stack is responsible for moving it from point A to point B. The nav stack takes in information from odometry, sensor stream. Of course, it'll take in the goal pose we give, which will be the end position of the robot. It might or might not take a map, depending on how we want it to move. And then it'll spit out velocity commands for the robot to actually follow and move to the end goal. But you probably knew this already. So let's go deeper into the design of the nav stack. So this is the design of the nav stack. It largely works around the move base package or the move base node when it's running. Move base is the central brain of this entire stack where it has all the state machines, planners, internal cost maps and recovery behaviors. So it'll take in information and transforms from everywhere and then it'll spit out velocity commands for the robot to follow. In the design you see white nodes are required but are already implemented so you don't need to implement them. Blue nodes are required and need setup for each robot platform from us. And the gray nodes are already implemented so you don't need to implement them but they are optional. We'll go into the details of all of this in a bit. But instead of directly talking about what the central brain is, which is move base, let's say it is a black box for a minute and let's talk about everything this black box needs for the navigation to actually happen. So it needs six things and two of them are optional. So four compulsory and two optional. The first one is the odometry source. Movebase needs odometry information to know about the robot's pose and motion. It uses a message type, which is nav underscore messages slash odometry. Second, sensor sources. Movebase needs laser scan or point cloud information about the environment so that it can understand what the environment looks like. And then it will have its uh, global planner and local planner plan the path according to these obstacles. Third, sensor transforms. Movebase needs publishing of transforms between different coordinates. This includes the transformation between map and odometry and odometry to base link. We've discussed about this in the previous video already. Fourth, base controller. Now, base controller is needed, which takes in commands or output commands from our move base package so that the robot can move. So it'll take in velocity commands from move base. Fifth, AMCL, and that is optional. If you're using a map, then AMCL is needed or any global localization method is needed to get the transformation between map and odometry. Sixth, map server, and this is optional. If you're using a map, then map server is the one responsible to provide a map to move base. So these were the six things move base needs. But of course, it also needs goalposts, right? Because it'll plan everything according to the end position or the end pose. One note here is that navigation can be initialized with or without a static map. When there is a static map, then that map is referred for global planning. But when there is no static map available, then global planning is done based on whatever obstacles were already encountered and move base or precisely the global plan inside move base will make optimistic plans for unseen areas. And as and when it encounters more obstacles in unseen areas, which are not unseen anymore, it will replan and reroute and do everything there. So essentially, Movebase takes in all this information and based on its internal global planner and local planner, 
it will create local paths and global paths. Now let's go into the details of this. A move base is not a black box anymore. So let's start looking at different components of move base. Global cost map. This is a cost map for global or full length path planning. It might or might not use a map based on your use case. And it is also augmented with real time information from sensors about obstacles. Second, local cost map. This cost map is only based on information in the vicinity of the robot. So whatever the robot can see, only that will be added to the local cost map. This cost map is actually used by the local planner later to plan local paths. Third, global planner. In Navstack, uh, A-star algorithm is used by the global planner to actually plan the path from its current position to the actual end goal. It takes in the global map, localization information and the goal pose. Also, it is only used as a high level or rough guide for the local planner later to actually plan the path. Local planner is the one to actually plan the velocity values. Fourth, local planner. This is the actual planner which decides the velocity values of the robot. It takes in the local cost map and the global planner's high level path to actually decide these values. Fifth, recovery. These are behaviors which are used when the robot is actually stuck or there is a potential failure. So in summary, inside MoveBase, global and local planners take in sensor information and cost maps to decide where the robot should move. The global planner gives a high level path and the local planner tries to follow it as much as possible. But based on obstacles and the local cost map, it actually gives out the velocity values for the robot. Now with all of this, when the nav stack came out, it actually became a force to reckon with. In fact, when it came out, it solved a massive problem beautifully. There was a problem of constructing, updating and accessing 3D information of the environment, which was done very efficiently or rather efficiently for that time. It used voxel based 3D mapping to model unknown space. If you're interested further, you should read the paper. I've added the link in the description below. So with all of this, the navigation stack worked quite well. But the world is not perfect, right? So there were quite a few problems. Let's look at the main problems in the navigation stack. One, and this one was a major problem. MoveBase package internally maintained an unconfigurable and monolithic state machine to do all of this. This did not give a lot of flexibility to developers to develop on top of this. And trust me, with monolithic code and non-modular code, you lose out a lot on uh, good development potential. Second, MoveBase worked only on differential and holonomic wheel robots. Third, MoveBase allowed the use of only a single global and local planner at a time. You could not dynamically load any other algorithm plugins for a different kind of planning once the system is up. And trust me, these were big problems when it comes to building your custom application with modularity and with a lot of control as a developer. So finally, enters Navigation 2. Navigation 2 in ROS2 solved these problems using a very different design. ROS2 was built to break ROS out of the lab and Navigation 2 also one-upped Navigation 1 or the nav stack using a very different design approach inside. Adding to ROS2's reliability, security and speed, it solved the problems we discussed before in the nav stack. But how did that happen? One, instead of using monolithic state machines like the nav stack in ROS1, it used something called behavior trees. If you don't know about behavior trees, I have a video or a series on behavior trees. Please look at that and I'm sure that'll help you. Second, it used modular servers for different kind of tasks like controlling or planning or recovery so that you can actually add more of them, swap them out and have your own custom feature there as a different server. Third, it now allowed the use of multiple local trajectory and path planners in a single run dynamically. But hold on, that's still a lot of jargon at once, right? So let's break it down and go into this gently. So these were the two pillars of the new navigation stack in ROS2. First one is BT Navigator or Behavior Tree Navigator. This is the highest level component and also the entry point, which actually hosts the behavior tree inside it. And this behavior tree replaces the state machine. You remember, right? Second, task specific asynchronous servers for controlling, planning, recovery, you have different servers and different modular servers. Each is a ROS2 node with an action server and they hold multiple algorithm plugins based on what they need to do. Additionally, all these nodes are managed or lifecycle ROS2 nodes so that they can be actually managed by something called a lifecycle manager. If you don't know about managed or lifecycle nodes in ROS2, please look at one video of mine which talks about all of this. Also as an added bonus, Navigation 2 or Nav2 is a framework in ROS2 which hosts a bunch of other packages too. So it's not that the packages are here and there. Most of the packages you need are in this navigation framework itself like AMCL and Map Server. They are a part of your navigation framework. And here is the design of Nav2. Right off the bat, our new brain, which is this blue box, needs your behavior tree information to know the design of your behavior tree. Again, that is very custom now. Previously in the nav stack, we had a monolithic state machine, which you could not configure. It also needs transform sensor information and maps like before. So now let's look at the core of this design. First, BT Navigator Server. This is the highest level component and entry point, which hosts the behavior tree to implement navigation behaviors. Once it gets any goal post from the user, 
It orchestrates the navigation tasks with its behavior tree inside. For us to externally communicate with this system, we use something called an action client from the outside and the action server, the corresponding action server is inside BT Navigator. The action is navigate to pose. In turn, the behavior tree nodes also use action servers to communicate with other servers like uh, planning, behavior, controller, etc. These servers are then used to control the robot, uh, make plans for the robot and then do recovery behaviors, etc. So now let's talk about these subsequent servers. What exactly are they? As I said, BT Navigator nodes can communicate with these servers using action clients from their end. And each of these servers are ROS2 nodes with action servers inside them. As and when a node in the behavior tree in BT Navigator server wants to talk to any of these servers, they just need to use their action clients to talk to them. And as I said before, these servers have their corresponding set of uh, algorithm plugins so that dynamically from the behavior tree nodes, you can decide which algorithm plugin to use for which server. One thing to note here is that the planning server is for global planning. A controller server is actually previously called the local planner, but now it's called the controller server because it controls the robot and your recovery server is for actually recovery behaviors. But you have a lot more control and and in fact, these are all modular, which means using your behavior tree design, you can actually decide to have another server. So you'll have your behavior tree design, which wants to talk to another server. That server can be custom for you and you can add another custom server in this design itself. So that is a lot of power to the developers, right? You can decide how your control flow is using your behavior tree. And for whatever custom flow you have, you can decide to have different servers for very different functionalities. That all depends on you. So I personally think that the sky is the limit here. You can do whatever you want because of modularity and a configurable behavior tree instead of a unconfigurable state machine, you can do whatever you want. Now you also have something called a lifecycle manager. Since ROS2 has something called managed or lifecycle nodes, all of these nodes are actually implemented as managed nodes. This lifecycle manager thus has a lot of control over the life of these nodes. So this is how the navigation framework solved quite a few problems in the nav stack in ROS1. But again, let's summarize and see how navigation 2 or nav2 in ROS2 was better, faster and stronger than the nav stack in ROS1. One, instead of monolithic and unconfigurable state machines, it used behavior tree. So you can make your own behavior tree for your custom application. Second, you have independent servers for different functionalities. So you can add new ones, swap them out, remove them completely. You have a lot of control over what you want to do. And the good thing is all of this is modular, which is super important for a good developer. Third, you can choose your algorithm plugin at runtime for whatever server you want to call using your behavior tree node. So now it can happen that you're using two different algorithm plugins for your planner for different nodes of your behavior tree. Now, some additional benefits of Navigation 2 framework I did not mention before. One, Navigation 2 supports a large variety of robots. It supports differential, holonomic, Ackerman, legged robots. So that's quite nice. Two, because it's in ROS2, it's using ROS2's multi-core processing techniques for low latency applications. And of course, I forgot, previously I told you that it uses ROS2 to manage nodes using its lifecycle manager to have a lot more control over nodes. So this was how the navigation framework in ROS2 was much, much better than the nav stack in ROS1. This video is of course not supposed to go into the extreme details of these two. Uh, it was still supposed to be an overview. There is a lot more ground to cover, which I could not in this video. So if you're interested, please check out the papers behind these two. I've added the links in the description below. In fact, a lot of my understanding comes from reading these papers. So please check them out. And this is all about this video. I hope you like this video. In the next video, we'll start using ROS2 and the navigation framework in ROS2 to get used to the idea of actually using the navigation framework in ROS2. And in the videos after that, we'll actually build something where we actually code our own packages. We'll use behavior trees and the navigation stack. And I think it'll be a great experience for you. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Please tell me how you like this video and I'd love to talk more about it. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.